So last Sunday, I said we're going to spend two weeks talking about the Holy Spirit. Now, for those of us who are Presbyterians, sometimes talk around the Holy Spirit freaks us out a little bit. Because the Holy Spirit is, is untamed. The Holy Spirit rolls, roams freely. The Holy Spirit that we're reading about in Acts chapter 2 in just a moment, there's tongues of fire and there's people speaking different languages and there's this rushing wind and some of us go, oh, that's, that's a little too much for me. So this morning I'm going to bring it down a notch and we're going to do Presbyterian Pentecost. And that actually comes out of the Gospel of John, which I promise we're going to get there in just a moment, but I have to set all of this up, okay? So last Sunday, we were looking at the Valley of Dry Bones in Ezekiel 37 and talking about the Holy, or talking about how God was saying to Ezekiel, can these bones live? When all Ezekiel saw was death and despair and uncertainty. And towards the end of that sermon, I brought up a text from the book of Job, where Job looks at his world, which was not much different than the world that Ezekiel was seeing, and Job is beginning to lose hope. But then he has this vision. And I want to start there, because if we are going to understand Pentecost, and we are going to understand the arrival of the Holy Spirit, we must first understand the resurrection So in Job chapter 19, we read this. This is verses 25 through 27. As Job looks at his life and considers his life and worries about what the future holds. And he he writes this or says this. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after I awake, though this body has been destroyed, then I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another how my heart yearns within me. So Old Testament, Hebrew scriptures, there are these visions, there are these understandings of this life that will one day be ours. Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives and that one day he will stand upon the earth. So as we move then into the New Testament, we recognize the arrival of that Redeemer, the arrival of the Messiah, and Jesus begins to speak and to teach and to preach and to heal. And then, particularly in the Gospel of John, he begins to talk about the arrival of the Holy Spirit. If you read John chapters 14, 15, and 16, you see numerous references, allusions, stories, about the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, verses 15 through 17, and then verses 25 through 27, Jesus kind of begins this conversation. This comes right after he has told the disciples he's going to his father's house. You remember John chapter 14, he, beginning of 14, he says, I must return to the father's house. The disciples start to have a panic attack over what it's gonna look like when Jesus leaves. Verse 15, he begins to speak of the Holy Spirit. We read this. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate. The advocate means one who stands beside to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. Jesus is saying, you know, if you love me, you keep my commands. And as you do that, I will ask the Father who will send the advocate, who will send the Holy Spirit, who will literally stand beside you. This is, the, this is a judicial language, the language of the court. It's like to have an advocate standing before you, standing beside you in court. And then he continues on a little bit later in John chapter 14, verse 25. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the advocate, verse 26, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus says, I'm sending one. I'm sending the advocate. The Father and I will send the one who comforts, who encourages, who stands beside you. 
Now you have to imagine, if you're the disciples, you're still very kind of confused by all of this language that Jesus is talking about of sending the Holy Spirit. Okay, so now we know that the Redeemer lives. We know there has been a resurrection. Jesus has been raised from the dead in John chapter 20. The Marys have witnessed that. Mary has gone to the disciples and says, tells them that he has been raised from the dead. But what do the disciples do? You probably are not quite remembering what they do, which is a good thing, because we're going to read about that right now. John chapter 20. Now remember, this is the Presbyterian Pentecost that's about to happen in front of you, okay? Instead of the Acts 2 Pentecost. On the evening of that first day of the week, this is verse 19 of John 20, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Just quiet, right? No tongues of fire. No voices going all over the place. No loud wind, just peace and receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, he continued on, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now you all are like, well, that's a bummer of a Pentecost. You're like, I want tongues of fire. I want action. I want loudness. I want wind. I want breath. I want all of that, these you know, crazy voices going, all of that. We're not going to talk about that today, okay? Next year we'll do Acts 2 again. But I love this, I just love the simplicity of this. Because the disciples are there in the upper room. The doors are locked, bolted, because of fear. They're afraid of the Jewish leaders. They're afraid of what might happen to them. They've locked everything down. And the only thing in the room is fear. There's uncertainty. This Jesus whom they had followed had been crucified. They'd heard that he had been raised from the dead. But they are allowing darkness to hem them in. And then what does Jesus do? I think there's several important teaching moments in this. Jesus, first of all, I mean, because he's Jesus, right? I mean, he can walk through walls. I don't really know how that happens. I don't know how Jesus does that. He's the Messiah, he's the Lord, I'm not. So all I know is all of a sudden he's there in the middle, uh, in their midst, he's there in their midst. And he shows up, and this is important, he shows up in the midst of their fear. They don't have enough faith to believe at that moment. And Jesus doesn't wait for them to have enough faith. He simply shows up. And I don't know about you, but that is really encouraging to me in my, in my walk with Jesus. Because sometimes there are, there are times when I'm like, Lord, I, I, I don't know what to do here. I'm not sure I have enough faith to step out. And what happens in this text, Jesus shows up when the disciples don't have the faith to move out, they've locked the doors in fear. And then he stands right in the middle. And he speaks. He doesn't yell. He doesn't get frustrated and angry. Like, why are the doors locked? I've been raised from the dead. He didn't have all sorts of histrionics about his disciples' complete lack of faith and complete lack of getting it and the frustration he had to be feeling of saying, come on, let's get this together. 
He just says peace. My peace I give you. My wholeness I give to you. John chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus has said this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. My peace I give you. And there's a very important progression that happens here as we think about how the Holy Spirit works in and through our lives. Jesus shows up. He stands in the middle. Jesus, in the Gospel of John, we'll see that you see this in a couple of different occasions. He's always in the middle. He's always in the middle of the disciples. He always wants to be in their midst. He sits with them at the table. He's, you know, when, when he's crucified, he's in between the two criminals. John says when Jesus shows up, he's in the middle of the room, bringing his peace. But then once he brings his peace, he gives them purpose. He says, just as I have come for you, so now you are to go and to go to others. And you are to do that with what? The power of the Holy Spirit. We move from peace to purpose to power. You want to think the way in which the gospel works in and through our lives and in and through this world, it begins with a peace that surpasses all understanding, which we're going to look at in several weeks. We're going to be preaching through the letter of Philippians. It begins with a peace that comes through Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that then gives us our purpose. And then the Spirit empowers us to go and live and love and serve as Jesus would have us do. Peace, purpose, and power. It is the arrival of the Holy Spirit. And everything changes. In that moment, those disciples' lives are transformed for good. Because up to that time, they had been locked down, locked away, hiding, fearful. And the Spirit of God shows up and everything changes. The world would never be the same. Because this is what God's Spirit does. Renews, transforms. Psalm 104, the psalmist looking to that day and looking at the movement of the power of the Spirit. Verses 27 through 30. All creatures look to you, the psalmist says, to God, to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. And then this, when you send your spirit, they are created. And you renew the face of the ground. God is in the business of creating. And God is in the business of renewing and Jesus looks at his disciples who had just been through this traumatic experience of loss and devastation and he speaks peace to them and he speaks encouragement to them And he says, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, will enable you to live in such a way. John chapter 15. Like I said, there's a lot in the Gospel of John. I was just praying I actually got through this sermon and remembered each text in the correct order of things. Because there's just so much great stuff in the Gospel of John. But listen to the work of the Holy Spirit as Jesus articulates this. Chapter 15. Verses 26 and 27. When the Advocate comes, the Holy Spirit comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, 
he will testify about me. So the Spirit helps point us to Jesus. And then this, and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. You see, this is then the work of the Holy Spirit that came on that day of Pentecost with fire and people speaking in different languages and people understanding different languages. And Jesus says, look, the advocate, the one who stands by your side, he will testify to me. He will point to me. You will know more and more about me because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Because you and I, guess what? We don't get to see Jesus. We don't get to be with Jesus. We don't get to have him standing in our midst. But we do get the power of the Holy Spirit, which changes everything. And Jesus says, look, I am doing this for you so that you then might go out into the world and change the world. And those disciples went from being scared young men sitting in a room with the door locked to go out into all the nations and to share the good news of Jesus because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything changed. Because now all of a sudden they had clarity. That's one of the things the Holy Spirit does for us is he brings clarity into our lives. Some talk about how the day of Pentecost is the reversal of of Babel. Y'all remember the story of the Tower of Babel, Genesis chapter 11, the great human story, right? Hey, here's what we do. We're going to go and we're going to build a tower and we're going to make a name for ourselves and we're going to build it up to the heavens. And God's like, no, 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 that's not the way things work. You don't reach me, I come down for you. And so everyone's scattered at Babel. But then at Pentecost, what happens? God comes down. God brings order. God brings clarity. The role of the Spirit brings clarity to our lives. The Holy Spirit transforms our lives. And ultimately, and I've been thinking about this a lot, the Holy Spirit makes us resilient. And boy, if we don't need resiliency right now, I don't know what we need. I was laughing. I'm, like I said earlier, I'm, I'm preaching on Philippians starting next Sunday. And so I was talking to Jim Sedgwick, our communications director, and we were going kind of back and forth around themes of Philippians. And, and, and I said, um, you know, there's this great text in Philippians chapter 2 where the Apostle Paul talks about pressing on and reaching forward and keeping the faith and keep going and keep going. And Jim was like, do you think people might be tired of pressing on? Do you think they really want to hear about that for 12 weeks in a row on the video that we run before I get to preach? Keep pressing on. Keep running the race. Finish the fight, right? Do all those great things. People, we know about pressing on, right? Like we're in the midst of it. But as I was thinking through this sermon, I was like, but what does the Holy Spirit do for those early disciples, for those followers of Jesus? He makes them resilient. Because through the power of the Holy Spirit, they realize that nothing That no matter what happened to them, that nothing would ever separate them from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit makes us resilient. He allows us to face each day, no matter what comes our way. The Spirit of God transforms our lives. Think about those apostles. No more fear. But a life of resounding resiliency. So I have a question for you. Where have you locked the door? What is keeping you from receiving the presence of Jesus? What fear has gripped you so deeply that you have locked everything and everyone out?
And fear is a dangerous thing. First John tells us that perfect love casts out all fear. But I'm afraid the opposite of that is true as well. That perfect fear casts out love. That when fear dominates our lives, whatever it might be, there is a struggle to love. And we could play that out in so many ways in today's world. But as we prepare to come to this table this morning, I want you to think about that. Where have you let fear begin to run your life? Where have you locked yourself down and not allowed the love and light of Jesus to be in your midst? We all have our fears. And that idea that 1 John talks about a perfected love casting out all fear is such an important reminder for us. I don't want our lives to be dominated by fear and darkness. But rather by the power of the Holy Spirit moving in and through us to hear that word that Jesus speaks of peace, of wholeness, of completeness. This is the promise of Pentecost. And so as we come to the table this morning, remember the one who stands in your midst. Remember the Savior, remember Jesus, who is willing to come through the walls and speak peace into your life. And to bless you with the promise of his Holy Spirit. Pray with me, please. Lord, we live in the midst of great uncertainty. It is easy to lock ourselves away. To try and hide from all the uncertainty and grief and sorrow that we see, to turn inward. But the beauty of Jesus is that he meets us right where we are. He doesn't wait until we have faith to overcome our fear. He simply shows up. And so Jesus, thank you for showing up. Thank you for this meal that is a visible reminder of your forgiveness and of your goodness. Lord, would you cleanse us of our sins? Would you restore to us the joy of your righteousness? And Lord, would you allow us to hand over to you through the power of your Holy Spirit Whatever it is that is bringing fear into our lives. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.